Catherine McKee, founder and principal of Morphology Consulting, discusses her passion for consulting and working with brands in the e-commerce industry. Catherine provides digital commerce consulting services focused on profitability and efficiency. She analyzes broad demand signals and customer behavior to help brands make actionable decisions. Catherine advises brands to test everything and trust their gut instincts while also seeking outside perspectives to identify areas for improvement. I've also discussed with Catherine the key considerations for brands in optimizing their websites and online presence. Catherine emphasizes the importance of understanding what the target audience wants and ensuring a user-friendly experience. Additionally, she highlights the significance of addressing bigger problems, such as high bounce rates and low conversion rates, which require research and analysis. The discussion continues to address the challenges brands face with Google updates and the need to provide helpful content as a result. Catherine advises brands to divorce themselves from the hype, manage egos, and focus on organic and direct traffic. She concludes by encouraging brands to embrace their uniqueness and provide value to customers. Dedicated to solving the most pressing challenges brands face, Catherine understands the importance of solving big problems and the personal and professional satisfaction that comes from doing so. Let's start with the interview. Welcome to the Ecom Pulse, your heartbeat to the world of e-commerce. I'm your host, Eitan Kotter. Join us as we meet with industry leaders, marketing experts, and the innovative minds behind the tech that is shaping the e-commerce future. So plug in, gear up, and get ready for a pulse-pounding journey into the heart of e-commerce. Hey, Catherine, how are you? I'm so doing so well. How are you? Really, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank uh, you. You're doing well. So uh, you look, you look ripped. You look busy. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, is it always like that, or is it uh, this this time of the year? Uh, this time of year is a little crazy. A lot of updates and things rolling out. So a lot of <clears throat> moving parts currently happening. Really? Um, yeah, pretty busy season. What about you? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, looks like a very. Uh, um uh, extensive time of the year obviously for us as well so um again i would love to you know to talk to chat with you today about those really amazing things that you do and i know you are on the consulting side for quite a while right i'm always interested you know in the background and what what drives you right to to be a like a you know a solopreneur and uh, starting your consulting business business so maybe for the listeners who don't know you too much so please uh uh, I'd like to give you some time to introduce yourself and also share with us why you are so passionate about the, you know, the consulting side of things and working with specifically with brands. Yeah, yeah. Great point. Um, I'm a one-trick pony. I've been doing e-commerce since the beginning, so really glad that that panned out. Glad mm-hmm. that that worked out and became an industry. Uh, so I was corporate side for a very long time, brand side for a very long time, about um, 15-ish years. And when I would switch companies, um, I often switched categories. So what would happen is when I would switch the company and I would go from, say, beauty to fashion, there would be a couple maybe small things still left behind at the previous brand. So I started doing sort of like proto consulting fairly early where I would go back and do a small project and just sort of like help them out kind of thing. And I found that I really enjoyed that. I really, really enjoyed being able to come in and fix a problem. It really played to my strengths that a sort of moving ahead in my corporate career kind of didn't. I think we've maybe all experienced that, that you go from an individual contributor to say a people manager to say an executive, and those are very different skill sets. And I think they're all wonderful skill sets. I would probably suggest that I don't have all of them. Um, And I think (laughs) that I'm much better at solving problems and being able to kind of come in and diagnose. And I got more and get more, I think, personal value out of it. It feels really good to be able to fix something. It feels very personally satisfying. And I think that's hard to do within a company. There are a lot of like political structures you need to go through. It's not always great for your career to call out a big problem. It's not always great in terms of team structure. You know, like if there's a problem, then people are probably involved in it. And I think a corporate world can be because you're on a team and because that team needs to stay holistic, it it can be kind of hard to call out a big thing and make a big change. And for that reason, I always really valued the consultants that we worked with and the other brands. And I find that it's an easier role for me. And it's something that I really enjoy. You kind of come in, you diagnose, you fix, and then you leave and let the team go back to doing what they're really great at. And I've always found that really kind of like empowering. Yeah. 
I think it's also related to the fact that you are quite unique because you know like the ins and outs of almost every you know corner of the e-commerce ecosystem, right? Back end, front end, operation. You know your way around the technology platforms, around digital marketing, supply chain. So probably it's an opportunity for you just to show and and um, let you know other markets uh, or brands also enjoy your experience, right? I think so. I hope so. I hope it works out for them. <laughs> I know. I, I know I it is. <laughs> <laughs> you think, I think you bring up a good point that a lot of problems are not in silos, and so I, I do think that that is maybe also a nice thing to have a consultant as well is that if you can come in and say like, yeah, your ads aren't working, but also it's because the inventory model is screwing up your flows and that's actually impacting your pricing model, which is impacting, you know, the customer experience, then we can like really solve it instead of it sort of having to sit on a team where it's, you know, like we think the price is the problem, keep running price analysis. Like you're only going to be able to get so much incrementality out of that before you have to have the other pieces aligned. And again, I think that's tough when you're within a political structure in a company. Yes, yes. I think it's very unique, again, to, to have this bird's eye view of everything that is going on in the in the ecosystem and how everything is influencing one another, right? And and so for, I mean, you, you're the founder and principal of uh, morpholo Morphology Consulting, right? And, and you call yourself like a digital commerce consulting. So mm -hmm. what, what, it, what, what it means for you? What are the type of services or expertise that you provide to, to your customers? Yeah, great question. Wish I had a better elevator pitch for that. Uh, so <laughs> brand marketing is not one of the things that we do. Yeah, we have a very long <laughs> elevator today. It can be like 100, 104. It's okay. Amazing. No rush. Amazing. <laughs> we, the foundation of the business is really profitability. So I, I always say that we start from that point. We are looking to give you efficiency in whatever mode you're doing. And mm -hmm. digital commerce, I have found, is very different from traditional commerce. And so particularly when I started, oh, which is eight or nine years ago now, there was a lot of kind of tension around very talented people who had been in retail for a long time, really kind of struggling to do well in digital commerce. And that's because it looks the same, but it is almost essentially the opposite. So we do a lot from that perspective, which is you have more data now and hopefully cleaner, better data. And if you don't, we can tighten up your website so the data is clean, that you can make more actionable decisions from it. And I we really try to stress that within companies, which is that there is no single thing that's driving anything in your business. There's no tactic that's the winning tactic. There's no team that's the winning team. Each of the things really touch each other and you need to have clean data to be able to look at that. So from mm -hmm. how we come in, it's often, you probably feel like you're experiencing a problem and we are very focused on doing a deep dive into like, what is, what is the actual problem or what are all the touch points and what are things that probably feel like huge wins that might be damaging your brand down the line. So like a promotion that's really hurting your regular business or an incrementality of a model that's alienating your customer or really kind of simple things. Like there are prices that are inelastic that really kind of damage a go-to-market for a customer and simple stuff. You know, I think for a lot of retail, a lot of what we do for customers is the devil is in the details. And I think mm -hmm. for a lot of retail Particularly, particularly traditional retail, you're in kind of a, a partnership with the retailer. And that isn't particularly true in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So when you're selling sneakers to Nordstrom, you and Nordstrom both share the goal of selling the sneakers, that particular pair. That's not true in e-commerce. There's a lot of like the customer is coming to tell you what they want. So they're, they are functioning in a pull model. They are pulling information towards themselves to make a purchase. Yeah you don't want to push anything at them because they're going to come and tell you what they want. But also if you're in an Amazon or even if you're in a D to C store, and even if you're an online retailer, you don't really share the goal of selling the sneakers. You exist to help the customer find whatever it is that they want. And so you might have way too many sneakers and that's fine. I mean, you need to adjust your inventory later, but there's, there's a big kind of like mental shift into we aren't selling down product. We are, making, holding, and shipping what customers asked for. And that, again, shows up really heavily in profitability. There's a really big, if you don't have to push them into buying it, if you don't have to promo it aggressively, if you don't have to sell it off after 30 days, you're going to make a lot more money. And customers do not shop the way retailers wish they shopped. Customers don't show up in 30-day cycles where you told them what the new thing was in the window and they buy that and they leave. And be great if that was outworked, but it's not. So what happens in e-commerce is a lot of customers are waiting a really long time. So if you're in apparel and you're used to shorts, the month that you sell shorts in, 
being March and that's it. That's not really true. It's it's October to April. Customers want them that whole time. Customers are buying bathing suits in March. They're buying them in November. And I think that's really kind of the, against the grain and sort of not how we do allocations. Because when you have a physical store, you you need the space. You don't have time. You can't just sit on racks of bathing suits. You need to move them out and get the jackets in. And that's a real constraint in wholesale and retail. That's a real thing that's happening mm-hmm. for people. And it just isn't in e-commerce. And I think that it's such a big shift that it sort of can throw people off sometimes. So we do a lot of work in that space. We do a lot in the sort of, it looks like X, but it's Y. Interesting. Interesting. You mentioned analyzing the data, right? Which is so important. I mean, f- probably from your perspective, you know, seeing all the retailers and brands and what's happening right now in the market. I mean, even even brands in the same niche with the same probably product categories with the same targeted customers, I mean, if it works there, it doesn't mean it, it works here, right? I mean, it's so easy to say, okay, there is a hype now. Let's let's do whatever all these companies are doing. They're in the same neighborhood that what we are doing. But it's 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 a mistake, right? You need to analyze. You need to understand the DNA. You need to understand exactly what's happening. And, and, and attribution is not so easy these days, right? So how do you analyze things? And I know it's, it's foundational for everything. And you mentioned also understanding customer behaviors and journeys. And how do you make this... Uh, let's say phase one of analyzing what's what's going on. Yeah, that is a phenomenal question. Um, you have to really go to the most blown out space. So <laughs> if if we start with a customer and we come in, we do a lot of broad demand signals. So we go into trended analysis of anyone shopping online. So not your website, but your category. What did they search for? What did they want? What are they talking about on Reddit? What did they Google? What did they run through Bing? There And there are free tools and widgets for that. Like anyone can do that. You don't need to buy software. Just to get a a gist, like what does the market want over this time period? What are they talking about? And truly that's where 90%, maybe 85% of what we do for customers comes from. There's a lot of kind of misunderstanding of a market, which is that like, you can have a phenomenal brand team. A lot of teams do. You can have a phenomenal PR team. A lot do. They created the hype cycle. Customers don't create hype cycles. Customers are still over here saying that they wish those sneakers were Velcro or that they wish that deodorant was unscented. And it's, it's that, that's always the really big, I wouldn't even call it white space. That's really sort of the big, like customers are constantly talking about what they want on the internet in a broad sense, like brand agnostic. They are just shouting into the ether the thing that they want. And that's usually really surprising for brands from a, maybe that's not what happened in a survey that you ran, or maybe that's not what's happening on your social. And I think when you get very tight and close to your brand, it's a situation where you can miss the forest for the trees that maybe customers love you personally and they think your brand is cool and they don't want to tell you that they think that the deodorant smells terrible. So they just don't, they just stop buying it. And you give them a post-purchase survey and they they told you that you were nice and you were fine. Mm-hmm. It's not true, right? Like you look at Airbnbs or something, something like a, you've, you've been in crazy Uber rides where the driver has like a 4.9 rating and you're like, hmm. we almost died. <laughs> That's not a five-star drive. Yeah. But it would be like mean to make it lower than a five, right? So I think I think the places where we want to look we have also sort of forced into being like emotionally kind. Like it's not fun to read a bad review. It's not fun to get a customer complaint. And I think we've sort of shifted into it's mean to be the customer that leaves a bad review or has a complaint. And that is really a huge disservice to brands because they're in a place where they looked at what should be close to their brand for information and it's wrong. And it's it's too soft. It's too fluffy. It's not nice. And then you're stuck wondering why you're not selling this very aggressively scented deodorant. And it's because secretly the market wants unscented, but no one would say that to your face. So I think you you really need to get out of your own realm. You really need to take mm-hmm. several steps back and be like, it's not going to hurt my feelings. I'm going to put my ego aside for a second, which is very hard. It, full transparency, that's very hard. Very hard, yeah. I really see what people want. And it's usually really surprising. It seems that you are uh, trying to zoom in to like deeper layers of what's really happening, right? Yes, we have a survey. Yes, we have a customer t- support ticket. Maybe uh, you know something they wrote on other pl- other platforms. But you're trying to take this whole information and try to probably analyze it in a more deeper level, right? What what's going on? What what's the foundation? What's the emotional state of shoppers to the brand, right? Yeah, and it's also it's also very interesting because you said that you know cons- consumers they don't they are they are being bombarded and overwhelmed with a lot of hypes, right? emotional connections, all these new mar- digital marketing 
tactics that everyone are aware of. But what car shoppers need is probably features, right? They need, they need a coat, they need a hat, they need something like that. So it's more of, a, and it is brown and the size large, and it's very, very feature sets, right? But uh, making the bridge between the marketing push, which, which is kind of a more trying to build the community around the brand and the emotional triggers versus the feature set that are required is, 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 is an interesting topic. And so if we zoom in, so you, you bring more visibility or insights or clarity to the brand owners say, or to the retailers say, hey, this is what's really happening right now in, in the market. Yeah, we try. Yeah. We try. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point because I think what you're describing is actually very productive. I think if you do have a community that's bought in, they will be honest with you. They will tell you what they want and they do have an emotional connection. And I think that's hard and it's rare. And so I think a lot of brands think that they're doing that when they try to do a hype cycle around something that's cool. Cool is ephemeral. Cool is not real. Cool uh-huh. is not, it's not a selling tactic yeah, for anyone. It's, it's, yeah. Which is tough, but people do buy with their emotions. People do buy with things like with fear, with happiness, with love of their family. And you mm-hmm. absolutely can tailor a product around that. This will make you feel more secure because your CSA ships every month. So you know that you're able to like lovingly feed your family clean food and vegetables. And it will be here every month because we are a huge farm and we grow and there will be no scarcity. Like those are emotions that you can sell to, but it's not like the cool kids are getting pumpkins delivered to them. And I think that's where brands kind of struggle a little bit because mm-hmm. you have to do a lot of deep work to understand your consumers. And it's yeah, sometimes not in line with what a founder or a brand team uh, wants to hear, which is fair. Yeah. I fully totally agree. You know, I see a lot of examples where the data is just so clear, right? It's like so obvious, but no one wants to really believe that this is the case or even want to implement some kind of a change to, to change something because they it's too much for them or overwhelm or maybe it requires too much of a process internal shift maybe even a culture you know difference uh, that needs to be put in place different people so how do you overcome these steps because for you in your analytical you know, thought process right and, and your, your experience once you have the analyzing the, not just the data but analyzing deep the data and trying to understand exactly what's happening on the foundations then the the way to probably provide various recommendation or processes to put in place, whether it's a complete digital, digital transformation or some improvement in certain areas, where do you see uh, companies are, you know, make mistakes during this this implementation process? Question. I think mistake number one that I see most frequently is that brands tested something and they got an answer that they liked, and they've become very entrenched in the like we checked. Our answer is right. (sighs) And I, you know, you said attribution earlier, and I think about this with A-B testing as Hmm. well. Those are uh, very complex formulas to run, and they're very easy to do incorrectly. So we see a lot of like, no, no, we tested it. Our pop-up is wonderful. And you're like, pop-ups are psychologically damaging to every single human being on earth. Your pop-up is not wonderful. But if you A-B tested it against something that was also kind of meh, Maybe it was 2% better. And for you, you checked, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you tested it. This one yeah. is better. And you're, that's your money. You're tied to your profits and your revenue. And you're, if you checked, you feel like you already know the answer. And I, having to come into the like, maybe let's check again, or like, maybe let's isolate it, or maybe let's do a holdout test, or maybe let's try a little further is one bucket. But the other one is really from a like, you need to think broadly. Do you like it if someone jump scares you at the grocery store? No. Mm -hmm. That's what a pop-up is, psychologically for human beings. If you know that you would hate it, so do they. And I think that that is one of those, like, tough ones because everyone does it. And getting over mimetic desire is a really difficult emotional place to be in. So I think we often circle back to the emotions. And I will really tell you that my line in the sand for everyone is – test it. And if it makes more money, just do that. Mm -hmm. And usually that is the like, okay, fine, we'll test it. And usually I'm not saying that zero pop-ups ever, if you were, you know, a Halloween store, maybe terrifying your customers would be the correct approach. So test it, but like test it with rigor, right? Like we all know what we want the answer to be. Right. And we all run a sort of like quick and dirty test where we're like, oh yeah, that agrees with me. So I'm right. Like good to go. Yeah. 
you got to be careful of that, right? And you want to kind of run back into it. And I think too, there's an element that is very um, unscientific that works like a charm, which is like, would your grandma be able to use this website? Hmm. No. Like, okay, then it's it's not the button color. It's it's the navigation or it's the fact that the images don't really tell any stories at all. They need to have words to have context so that like giant hero image is not doing you any favors because no one knows why that girl is smiling. That kind of stuff where you're like, oh, okay. Because it's easy to get in the weeds. It's easy to get into the like, should she be smiling or not smiling? When the answer is like, don't have a photo. That's really hard to see when you're that deep in it. So we do a lot of that too, which is like, let's just try it. If we stripped everything out, if we stripped out all the bells and whistles from this website, would anyone get it? And if you're on, say, like a sax.com, sorry, sax.com, because it's all enormous images, there's not really any information anywhere on there. And so if a search engine came in and a search engine can't parse images, so we just gray squared all the images, like, what is the search engine reading? Mm -hmm. That's also what your grandmother's reading. That's what a regular person is reading. Because I don't actually know why that girl is dancing. I don't know if it's the shoes or the bag or it's perfume or it's food. I don't know why we have that picture unless you tell me. And I think there's a lot of resurfacing around that, which is that like pictures can be incredibly powerful. Yes. But that's a really downstream thing. This upstream thing is what do you sell? Because your website doesn't say it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So these uh, processes are something that, uh, I mean, you've gained experience during the years in the industry. These are some of your best practices or, or these are the, you have a kind of a methodology, you know, open mind, let's gather the data and try to analyze what needs to be improved. I mean, there are like some obvious things that you immediately, immediately see and knows what needs to be done or wh where are you in this spectrum of, you know, best practices versus let's analyze what's really happening here and try to come up with a creative solution for that. Yeah. Great question. I think the answer is always both. And I, yeah. I'm firmly in the test everything, but trust your gut camp, mm -hmm. which is you, you can't actually test everything like that was sort of a throwaway sentence. So my scope on, if you were a brand owner and you're trying to figure out what's happening, get an outside perspective first. That's very loose. Have someone who has nothing to do with you look at your website and tell you what they think. Because that's really where the 90% of the problem is. That's yes. where your your big levers are the things that you're completely missing. That the video loads slowly, that the squares are too big, that the font is weird and they can't like read the words. Mm -hmm. Things that you, you won't notice because you're close to it. Once that stuff's out of the way, then yes, you do want to really rigorously test anything that's left. But what's left should be really few. There should only be a couple of things. So I think like step one is very much in a broadly, what does this category want? What do they talk about? What do they care about? <clears throat> and then double check. Do we talk about that? Would they see themselves here just from like a, a very broad perspective? Once you fix that, then you can go a little deeper, which is kind of like tactical. How are things working on a website? Is the user experience good? Is it strong? That you probably need an outside perspective on too, because you're used to your website. So you're, mm -hmm. you know where everything is. If your grandma can't find the socks, you need to change your navigation, right? And that's true of almost everybody. There's a lot of bad navigation out there. Those are kind of the big chunks. After that, I think you can really get into where their eyes are dwelling on a page and types of reporting that you can run. Should Are these colors making sense? Should you change that copy? And you probably should. But those changes are going to get you less than 1% gains. Mm -hmm. they're, they're important. You do want to do them. But they're not like worth a lot. If your bounce rate is around 50%, you have bigger problems, right? Yeah. Th those are big problems to look at. If your conversion rate is 2 3% on a website, you, you have some problems. That's a really high intent area. And that's probably not a button color thing. And it's probably not like a copy thing. It's, it's something deeper where we're missing something that the customer needs. And that is not a testable thing. That is a research. That is a like back out look around, double check. What are people saying? How are they behaving? Mm -hmm. You can fire some GA4 events that will give you a little bit a better semblance. But I think the big ones really are your conversion rate and your bounce rate. Benchmarks for those are really bad. You don't want to be at the benchmark. You want to be good. So yeah, everyone's right. for last. You don't want to be yeah. second to last. You want to be first, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. So what are the major challenges or pains that you see brands are dealing with, you know, these days? 
Oh, long list. Long list. Wow. Long list. <laughs> The biggest, most topical one, I think, is the updates coming out of the helpful content update from two years ago. Those mm -hmm. have been slowly rolling out and they were expected to be done uh, this month, I believe. I think they're, Google's a little bit behind on that. Yes. Um, and people are really getting pounded in that. And I, I think that's a tough row to hoe for brands because I think it feels like Google is punishing them from a sense of like being mean or wanting to like steal their traffic and make them buy ads. I think there's an emotional state, a, a difficult emotional state for a lot of brands, which is that they feel attacked. And the answer to that is you are not being attacked. You just weren't following the directions. And that is another emotional state that's difficult, which is it's hard to hear that you're the problem. And the, the answer I give to a lot of brands is like, but if you're the problem, you're also the solution and you have all of the control to fix it. And that is a wonderful position to be in. Yeah, You're not being attacked. You're trying to, I was described as trying to pull open a push door, which is, it's frustrating. It's maddening. It also doesn't work. And as soon as you're able to kind of like calm down and recenter and be like, oh, push and push it open, like you, you will do better. But it's very frustrating until you can get to that place. And I think that's what I see with a lot of brands is that the... The environment that you're in is not attacking you, but the environment does have rules. And the more we stop trying to hack them and the more we just follow the directions, the easier it is, the much easier it is. But I will also say that that is not what most of the this cohort talks about. There's a lot of chatter and it's very exciting to feel like you're going to hack something, like you're going right. to make the system do something else that's very emotionally appealing, particularly if you're an entrepreneur, particularly if you're someone who kind of likes to buck the trend, who wants to be the, the, the thought leader, you want to be the person who's like making the big change. It feels very exciting. And unfortunately, it's a very expensive <laughs> and not terribly productive way to go to market. So what, what do you see? How do you see brands are dealing with this? With this specific topic, right? Of... Uh... You know, the iOS and now, although, you know, Google announced uh, postponing cookie deprecation, but what, what are what are brands are doing to overcome this? Well, I'll tell you what they should be doing. Okay. You, you want to make your website helpful. So I think particularly, I think Google tries really hard to do this and it does not land very well. And I get it because I try to do this too and it doesn't land very well. The helpful content update is means exactly what it says. They are measuring how people are using your content, your website, your whatever, and whether or not the c customer gets where they're going. Yeah. So it is or is not helpful. So if you are a brand who say sells lipstick and you wanted to gain some traffic over the last couple of years and you added a blog to your website so that you could keyword stuff, so that you could do longer tail keywords, so that you could mm -hmm. get more authority and more credit, so you could do internal backlinks, so if you could do all the tricks, right? That's not helpful. So what Google is saying to you is people do like blogs. They do. They want to read information. It shouldn't be attached to a brand though, because that's not helpful. That is marketing. Uh -huh. Blogs are helpful because people want to learn about things, but a blog on a commerce site isn't helpful. And it's also like a little slimy and a little gross. You shouldn't be giving the person information and being like, I'm hundred percent the answer. That's kind of yucky. So you want them in separate places. You could still have a blog and there are lots of categories in which you do want information like cars, mattresses, expensive skincare. There are lots of them where it would be really helpful to the customer for you to give brand agnostic information, but it shouldn't be on your commerce site because that is gross. So when they're kind of punishing the behavior, they, it feels sort of obvious from way back where you're like, well, well, yeah, because you didn't do it to be helpful. You did it to steal traffic. The The largest data network in the world can see you doing that. So like, right. stop, stop doing that. Right. I and mean, I think that's where we get lost. And I think that is when you're in a digital commerce space, you want to win. And when you're a brand, you want to win. You want to win revenue. You want to win profits. You want to beat your competition. You want to take their traffic. That mentality is very counterintuitive to a like clean data system, which is like the right answer should win. And it might not be you. Do you make the best whatever? And for most brand founders, they're like, of course I do. And you're like, do you actually? And I think that's 
hard, right? Because if you naturally should be number 10, but you want to be number one, you want to like do what it takes to move up. And search engines are beginning to punish that behavior. They are beginning to be like, but you can't lie. So if you conquest someone else's keywords, if you are Adidas and you are bidding on Nike search terms, functionally from a data standpoint, you're a liar. And I think that's very tough to hear from brands. They're like, no, 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 we both sell sneakers, so it's fine. And the person might want to hear about mine. And you're like, they literally do not want to hear about yours. They typed in the thing that they want. So you pretended to be the thing that they wanted to get their attention. And that is uh, gross behavior. Yeah. And customers hate it. Customers don't click your links. They they leave your site immediately. The blog takes forever to load. They don't read it. Or they come into your blog, they read the blog, and then they're like, why am I in a, a store? And they leave. That is all being tracked and catalyzed, cataloged and analyzed. It's not helpful. And I think that is really the, again, it's like a mental emotional hurdle, which is like what the system wants from you is truth and honesty. That's not necessarily how all brands behave and not the brands are trying to be shady. They're not, and they're not trying to be malicious, but there is, there's a different, they're competing in a game that no one else is playing. And I think that that becomes uh, very confusing, very stressful. It's very interesting, and you mentioned the st- the mental state. I think it's also a psychological state because you you actually it's encouraging you to try to look deep inside yourself and what's unique about you, right? Yeah. And then you need to tell the story that is a specialized story. It's a unique story that you know provides some additional value or some kind of a differentiation than the rest. And this will be appreciated by Google. This is, I think, the message that they're trying to, to deliver, right? And, yeah. um, and by customers, right? Yes, your sure. conversion rates are going up when your website. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so now, Catherine, we're going to do a small game. Okay? okay, we had a we had a prep call, which I think was a very very small move because you, you provided some really crazy yeah. quotes that I'm going to repeat now. Okay, one by one, and I want the listeners to hear and, and understand exactly what you mean. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, I'll start with the first one. Divorce yourself from the hype. Yeah. Okay, what do you mean by that? I mean that hype cycles are mostly made up and they're, again, very easy to become emotionally attached to. Hype isn't real. It, it, it isn't what customers want. It's not what they think. And getting very it's easy to getting easily distracted by wanting to attach to them is an enormous waste of your time. Like the, like you said earlier, the thing that you do is great and people want it. Jumping at the shiny object every two seconds is not going to gain you the share that you want. Yeah. And it becomes exhausting. It's the kind of thing where if you're constantly sort of like scrabbling after the cool thing, cool things only last a couple of weeks. Like that's not, you're not going to grow your business like that. And I think it's very relaxing once you step out of that chaos. It's very relaxing. Well, there's a lot of calm. pressure to go. There's a lot of yes. pressure to go with the hype, maybe from your board, from your colleagues, I mean, from all over, right? For sure. For sure. <laughs> that is a great point. It's not the easiest thing to do, for sure. Yeah. But I do think, you know, being settled in who you really are and what you really offer is is the way you avoid it. Because some hype cycles, maybe you should jump on. There probably Mm -hmm. are some that are perfect for your brand. It's not all of them. And it's probably not most of them. But there probably are one or two where you're like, yeah, we we should do this. It is beautifully aligned for us. You need to know yourself to be able to do that. But it's definitely not all of them. Yeah. As as long as it's aligned with your North Star, maybe, or your why, or (laughs) who you are as a brand, right? Okay. Number two, egos are expensive. (laughs) I'll say that one (laughs) I say that one a lot. Yeah. It, egos are very expensive. They are, you know, like we touched on a little bit earlier, reading a bad review, there are brands who will be personally deeply insulted and their brands will be like, how could you do that? That's so mean. That's so awful. They will ban the customer. They're enraged by that. And you're like, that's your ego. Does the deodorant smell bad? Have you checked? Mm-hmm. Did you look? <laughs> And usually it does, but that's not, that's not pleasant to hear. Right. And I think when we're in a, or, you know, we go to websites a lot of times and we'll be like, take your brand video down. No one, not even your mother wants to watch that brand video. That is never pleasant to hear that, that hits an ego pretty hard, but it's true. Your customers absolutely do not want to spend their time watching that video. You need to take that out of it because that is increasing your bounce rate. It's dropping your conversion. It's alienating customers. It is really upsetting for people. That's expensive. You're in a business to make money. 
the main part of giving, getting money from customers is being a servant to them, is being yeah. in service to them, getting them what they want. And it's very hard to do with an ego. Yes. I mean, tough times are not a question of if, you know, it's a question of when. Crisis mode, crisis time, it's definitely going to happen. And during these times, obviously, ego is on the rise, right? So that for, right. For, for the team, how do you manage this crisis model or this uh, when you need to implement something and you say there's a lot of ego involved what, what are your tools or tactics that you implement to, to smooth out you know implementation and decision making god i wish i had a good one uh, that is a great time to get a consultant it's a great time to pay someone to be the harbinger of bad news it's a okay. great time to pay someone to be the problem yeah um as a consultant i will tell you that i'm a very straight shooter i am a very okay. you should hear the bad news very bluntly and very upfront Probably not the smoothest way. It's definitely sort of like the bullet hole path and not the like graceful smooth path. If you're in a corporate environment, that's obviously not an option. So in a corporate environment, I think it's more about getting data, shoring up your reasoning and kind of gracefully sort of trying to deliver pieces of that information so that you can all kind of slowly get aligned. That's a much longer process and it's a much more um, finessed process. <laughs> nice. Okay. Number three. Okay, it's about CAC, right? You win when you are on a keto diet. <laughs> remember that? Yeah, you you yeah. win when you are on a keto diet. You remember we talked about CAC? Yes. Yes. yes yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's your CAC shouldn't be high. It shouldn't be high at all. And the CAC height, I think, also flows back into egos being expensive. You mm -hmm. shouldn't be buying your traffic. You shouldn't be paying for your friends. You you should not be in an environment where you are creating demand, which is like a very po popular thing to talk about now. You're not you're not creating demand. That's that's not true. Yeah. This is where we're getting into the hype cycle. This is where we're getting into too focused on ourselves being like the tastemaker. You aren't. Your CAC is coming from people who have a problem that you solve. You need to reach them. But you reach them by taking out a lot of the fluff and out a lot of the nonsense about being really clear about who you serve, what you sell, where you are. The people are already searching for you. You can run ads for incrementality. Absolutely. That can be incredibly helpful. You can pay for influencers for reach. You, you can pay for all of these things. And maybe you should. But a good like 70%, 80% of your traffic should be organic and direct. Wow. So if it's 70, not, you, you, yeah. Wow. yeah. Only 2% okay. of clicks go to ads. So I mean... Wow. And I, I think, what do you think is uh, the, the ratios out there? I mean, I assume like well, it's the other way around for most brands, right? Yeah. For most brands that we look at, it's probably like 20, 30%. 20, 30%. Yeah. Definitely brands get high valuation, whether, you know, uh, you know, inbound to outbound or earned versus, um, you know, buy, right. uh, paid media ratios are, are higher. Multi-channel is also an important topic. I mean, if you sell just in one channel, then obviously your risk is very, very high. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You don't need to be in all of them, but you probably do need to be in more than one. Great. So, Catherine, amazing stuff. So, tell us how people, how brands can find you. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, if you can come by the website, it's morphologyconsulting.com, all one word. You can find me on LinkedIn under Catherine McKee or under Morphology. The Catherine McKee one's better. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on X if you like to talk there. I'm on intro if you like to set aside consulting calls and chat. But website's probably the easiest. Great stuff. And Catherine, anything else you want to add? No, I don't think so. I think we covered it. I will do a pause one. Yeah. Your thing is good. I, I think for a lot of brands, you can get, particularly in an economic downturn, particularly in a tougher time, it can feel like you're failing and you're not. People want your thing. It is good. They are looking for you. There are ways to remove their obstacles so they can get to you faster. And that is a much more efficient way to run your business. And it's also a lot healthier. You, are, you personally are going to feel better when you aren't begging people to love you. And you're just sort of like accepting <laughs> the fact that they want to come to you. And they do want to come to you. Yes. Great. And all the brands out there, any challenges that you have, Catherine is the perfect person to talk to. And that's, uh, and I appreciate the time, Catherine. Thank you so much. Yeah, you too. Thank you. It's been okay. a pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Your support means the world to us. If today's episode has been insightful for you, consider sharing it with someone who would also benefit. Even one share can make a big difference. 
Looking to elevate your e-commerce game? Discover Vimy, a multi-channel e-commerce platform that will transform your business with the power of shoppable video. Visit us at vimy.net to learn more. It's vimy, V-I-M-M-I.net. Thank you for being part of our journey. Stay tuned for more invaluable insights in our next episode.